Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank CG's public event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books, for their support in making this a successful series. Besides the audience here tonight, we also have a global audience watching on the live webcast. And following this evening's address, we welcome questions from the audience, whether here at the auditorium or online. If you're watching online, you can ask questions through the live chat function on your screen, and we'll transmit those questions to our guests on the stage through this screen. Tonight, we address an important topic in international affairs. Election day has come and go, and uh, in fact, too many of us take the right to vote for granted in democratic countries. And we see how electorates can shape governments, which in turn can shape domestic tax rates and uh, services such as social programs and health care that governments provide, affecting all the lives of voters. But much less understood or examined, perhaps, is the impact electorates can have beyond their national borders uh, due to changes in military spending or foreign aid or uh, foreign policy. This evening, we're lucky enough to have Thomas Edsel to share his insights into how the American electorate may be influencing U.S. domestic and foreign policy during President Obama's second term. Uh, lucky we are, first of all, because we weren't sure if Thomas would fight his way through a major winter storm to get here from uh, the balmy breezes of New York City. Uh, but he did, brave soul, and uh, thank you for making it. And also lucky because of his credentials. Uh, Thomas Edsel joined the full-time faculty at Columbia University as a Joseph Pulitzer II and Edith Pulitzer Moore Professor of Journalism after a 25-year career at the Washington Post, uh, during which time he covered all aspects of U.S. national politics, including presidential elections. He currently writes an online opinion column for the New York Times and is also a correspondent for the New Republic and has reported on politics for the Baltimore Sun and the Providence Journal. He's frequently contributed to TV and radio commentary to many networks, He's the author of five books. He's written extensively for many renowned journals and magazines. So please now help me to welcome Thomas Edsel. Uh, thank you very much, Fred. I hope you can all hear this. I, I'm really honored to be here at CG. This is, uh, I had not heard of the University of Waterloo or CG when I first got this invitation, and since studying this uh, institution, it is an extraordinary development produced over a half century, I guess. Uh, uh, and you've become a renowned center of learning. Um, I wanted to apologize to those of you who have come here to hear a lecture on sex in the Citadel. <laughs> uh, I, I am not going to. I wish I could, but I uh, <laughs> But unfortunately, it's not an area of expertise. Um, I, instead, I have the fortune or bad fortune to study American politics, which is very interesting, but it's a little bit screwy. And um, one of the things I was struck before I get into the slides was I did a brief survey. I don't know much about Canadian politics at all, uh, but I'm really struck that the Canada seems to be moving in exactly the opposite direction from the United States. In the United States, the left is gaining more and more power and more influence. The, we're going to go into that in a great deal. Here in this country, the Conservative Party has uh, gotten full control over government and has been pushing policies, certainly not as far right as some of the Republicans in the United States, but a significant difference from the more traditional Canadian approach to governance. Uh, but it's not my expertise, so I'm not going to, well, I'll touch on it at the end, but it's not going to be central to this. What I wanted to describe really is this shows you the Obama coalition from one respect. This is how people voted. Now, the, Obama did very well among young voters, 60 to 37. He did very well among black voters, Hispanic, Latino, 
uh, and Asian American voters. He did very well among the least educated and the most educated. Uh, he, the bottom line there is when it says a few times a year or never, that's how often they go to church. In America, if you are an atheist, you are a Democrat. If you go to church every week or more, you're a Republican. This shows you, this is the, what politicians and strategists in the United States describe as the rising American electorate. It's made up of African Americans, I don't know if I can get this to work, here, youth, oops, I'm not doing too much here. Uh, youth, Latino, and unmarried women. What's, they overlap, and where you see the overlapping part in the center, but that forms the core of the Obama coalition. One group is really missing here, which is well-educated professionals, not in the business class, but people in the doctors, lawyers, high-tech people, they have become increasingly a democratic constituency. What's important here, just to begin with, is that these groups are all to the left of center in American politics, and they are all growing. Latinos are growing the most rapidly, unmarried women, but I have to add that unmarried men tend to lead to the Democratic Party and are more liberal than married married men, young people, African-American voters. These, this is a universe that is supportive of government. It is supportive of what we call in the United States the safety net, the whole set of programs for when you have unemployment or an economic crisis, a floor to protect people from falling all the way down to basically destitution. Uh, that's the common uniting factor. They are also, we're gonna get more into this, not in favor of an aggressive foreign policy. They tend to be much more supportive of peace as a goal and not supportive of defense spending. Here is where the left and right, which is taken as Obama voters versus Romney voters, where they disagree most. The biggest difference is on the question of the scope of government. People are asked in polls, uh, should government be active in providing social services? Is that your first priority? Or is reducing the size of government and reducing your taxes your highest priority? Romney voters, who are 47% of the electorate, uh, are way over to the right on that, and Obama voters are way over to the left. The attitudes toward labor unions is next. Environmental policies, which actually used to be an issue that Republicans and Democrats were both in favor of, have increasingly become real differences. Then that, what I mentioned before about the social safety net is a huge difference, and then it goes on down the line. These are the top issues or issues where uh, uh, Obama voters stood out. The top question, which is, is about abortion, should abortion be legal in all cases or in most cases? Both constituencies, and they make up uh, almost 60% of the electorate, are decisively uh, pro-Obama people who place a high priority on health care are also three to one Democratic. People who are concerned about housing, two to one Democratic. And gay marriage, they, that again is three to one Democratic. The, uh, these are similar, but what's important here is how in America, we've got a polarization, and I'm not sure how this correlates with, with Canada. Married men are the most conservative. 
And uh, you can see here that 60% of married men voted for Romney, only 38% voted for Obama. The most liberal are non-married women who voted better than two to one for Obama. Uh, taxes, should taxes be raised to help cut the budget deficit? Obama voters three to one in favor, Romney voters almost two to one against. Uh, do you think uh, the US economic system favors the wealthy? Obama almost three to one, uh, whereas uh, Romney voters by better than three to one believe that the system as we now have it is fair to all voters. This is what's happened. The, the, uh, uh, many of you may have heard of the gender gap in the United States, where ever since Ronald Reagan first ran in 1980, women voted more Democratic and men more Republican. They diverged for the first time in substantial ways. Uh, the gender gap, which is the brighter blue color, has remained relatively constant. What's really been growing is the marriage gap. Uh, and you can see now that the difference between married people and non-married people is 43 percentage points. That's a huge difference. Whereas the gender gap is 18 percentage points. Uh, key difference is more. Which is closer to your view? Government should do more. This is the one about government. What is the basic role of government? You can see the huge difference between the two sides. Government should do more uh, to solve problems. Obama voters, 81%. Romney voters, 17%. The other side is government is doing too many things that should be left to businesses, business and individuals. Obama, 24%. Romney, 74 That is a, we're talking about a divide of statistically of massive proportion. Immigration, which is clearly a major issue now. Again, Obama voters, should immigrants, meaning illegal immigrants now in the country, be offered a chance to get legal status? Obama voters, a little less than two to one, yes, uh, or 60, yeah, 61, 28. Uh, whereas uh, Romney voters said they sh should be deported from the country, 73 to 37. This goes on, there's more and more of these things. How, this is the one about religion. How often do you attend services? You can see here, if it's more than once a week, 63% voted for uh, Romney, whereas if you never go to church, 62% vote for Obama. Global warming, this is one that, it, back in 1998, when this first begins, there was very little difference between the parties, and the third, the light green line is independent voters. This is the percentage of people who say global warming is exaggerated, i.e. they don't believe in global warming in effect. For Republicans have gone from 35% all the way up to 67% believing that it's exaggerated. Independents have increased from 34, 35% up to 42% modest, whereas Democrats have stayed pretty consistently very low percentage believing that, those, that the fears about global warming are exaggerated. Defense spending, again, a big difference, but it shows up mostly in the percentages that say too little or too much, not the ones in the middle, they tend to be about the same percentages. But too little is spent on defense, Republicans 40%, whereas Democrats only 9%. Too much, Republicans only 18%, Democrats 53%. This is support for U.S. drone attacks. In fact, most Americans support the use of drones. Uh, and there's a little difference between the parties, but basically majorities 
of Republicans and Democrats support the use of drones. Uh, we'll see later that's not true internationally by any means. This is a, an important question. What the best asked, do you agree or disagree, that the best way to ensure peace is through military strength? Republicans have become increasingly convinced that military strength is the way to achieve uh, uh, peace. Democrats have become slightly more suspicious of that view, going from 50% to 44%. Independents have stayed fairly constant over time. That's, this, this is an important question, and it is a, obviously a central one to foreign policy decisions. Uh, this is, compares the United States to four uh, European countries, Britain, Germany, France, and Spain. Uh, Britain is a, there's very little data compare, that I could find comparing US with Canada on these questions, which I would have preferred to use. But in many ways, uh, Canadian views are often similar, not identical, but similar to the views in Britain. Free, the question is here is the freedom to pursue life's goals without interference from the state versus the state should guarantee that nobody is in need. In the US, that's a 58% in favor of freedom over a strong state preventing uh, people from being in need, whereas in every other of these four European countries, majorities believe that the priority should be that states protect, uh, prevent people from being in need. It would be interesting to know what the uh, Canadian view on that is. Here's the opposition internationally to drone strikes. In the United States, you can see overall 62% uh, approve, 28% disapprove. In every other country, pluralities, in the case of Britain, or majorities uh, agree that disapprove of them, except for India, where the numbers are for some reason very small. Uh, but virtually, the, the popularity of drones is not, is, is the United States stands alone, basically, on that. This is a question that really shows the degree to which the United States supports individualism as opposed to uh, state intervention. In the United States, ask, when people are asked, life is determined by forces outside our control, 62% disagree. The numbers go steadily, are smaller, Britain 55%, Spain 47 France 43 and Germany 27 uh, Here again, military force. Is it sometimes necessary to use military force to maintain order in the world? The United States, <coughs> 75% agree, Britain 70%, France 62, Spain 62, Germany 50. Approval of the UN, getting a UN approval before using military force to deal with international threats. Every country but the United States uh, pretty strongly agrees that you should get UN approval, not just decisive majorities. The United States is split right down the middle on that, 44 to 45. Uh, the United States, as many of you know from the George Bush days, was very willing to perform unilateral interventions uh, or with minimal multinational support. The, the belief in acting in a multinational sense in foreign affairs is much lower in the United States than most other countries. Though let me just say that from what I've read about uh, Steve Harper, he also appears to be very wary of the UN and much more willing to consider uh, unilateral action on the part of Canada. Uh, that's the one I just had. Here's a sense of superiority. Our people are not perfect, but our culture is superior to others. Americans, yes, basically. 
uh, but it's a plurality, 49 to 46. No other country is there a plurality or a majority in favor of cultural superiority. And I was surprised to see France be so humble. <laughs> uh, I sort of raises questions about this poll. Um, but according to this, France is 73% in disagreement that, they're not, that they are not superior to others. What? I think anyone who has tried to get service in a French restaurant with an American, with a non-French accent would disagree with this poll. I, here's the question again about individualism. Well, it's basically the same thing asked in a different way that we already saw. This is what's been going on in America in terms of the way the political parties have divided. What this shows is the ideological location of members of Congress. The blue dots are Democrats, the red dots are Republicans, and it's the Congress that uh, was held from 1969 to 1970 before polarization began in earnest. You can see that there's a great deal of overlap between the two. There's a lot of uh, Democrats who are well into the Republican range and a lot of Republicans who are into the Democratic range. By 2003, 2004, this is the most recent data I could get, there is no overlap whatsoever. There is basically a space between the two parties with no, co no commonality between any individuals. Uh, and if anything, this has gotten even more so, especially after the 2010 election when Republicans did very well electing Tea Party candidates. This again is a church thing again. Uh, it's the presidential vote, uh, voting for Obama. If you go to church, never 65%, but we've already been through that. I should have skipped that one. Here's an interesting question on the character of the parties. People were asked, are, is capitalism, are, can, are capitalism and Christian values compatible? Can you be a capitalist and a Christian in effect? Overall, the general public leans slightly against that, that capitalism is at odds with Christian values by 44 to 36%. Democrats are better than two to one arguing that capitalism does not mix with uh, Christianity. Independents are even. Republicans are somewhat in, uh, supporters of the two. Being that, one, that a capitalist can be a good Christian. And Tea Party people are decisively uh, in agreement that capitalists can be, and can be both Christian and a capitalist. Uh, this is not that interesting a trial. This shows you uh, it's essential for the president and Congress to act this year on Deficit legislation, there's not much, too much difference between the parties, 81, Republican, 65. Uh, where the big differences occur on gun legislation, Republicans only 19%, Democrats 71, and climate change, 15, Republican, 47, Democratic. These are generally energy questions uh, and it will get to the Keystone Pipeline in a minute, but again, uh, Democrats are much more in support of tough emission control and less supportive of exploration. This is a chart, again, it shows you what's happened and the, how the, remember how Republican, this question was, is it the responsibility of government to take care of people who can't take care of themselves? Republicans in 1987, this is after the election of Ronald Reagan, the rise of the conservative movement, still 62% of Republicans back then felt that that was a responsibility. 
That has fallen 22 percentage points to 40 percent. That's a big, big drop. There's been much less change, although it, the change has been down among uh, independents from 70 to 59, an 11 point drop, and Democrats 79 to 75. This shows you where Democrats have changed much more than Republicans. The question asked, I have old fashioned values about family and marriage. People were asked that. Again, back in 87, there was almost un unanimity on this, 86, 86, 92. But now, Democrats have dropped 26 points. Republicans have stayed the same, and independents have fallen 14 points. These are some very interesting questions that are asked by a scholar, Jonathan Haidt, who's written a book called The Righteous Mind, trying to analyze what it is that the moral structure of liberalism versus the moral structure of conservatism. These are questions that were conducted and people were asked, in this case, how strongly do you believe in this in the highest numbers for liberals agreeing and conservatives disagreeing, the biggest difference that he found was on the question, I believe peace is extremely important. Liberals, and that liberals here also overlaps with the Obama coalition. Liberals place a high priority on peace generically in every sense of the word. They also, th this follows on a whole Understanding appreciation and protection for the welfare of all people and for nature. Again, big, high on the liberal scale, low on the conservative scale. An interesting question is, what is ethical varies from one situation to another. Liberals do not, in many respects, believe that there is a fixed external morality. They believe that there are choices that are to be made by individuals depending on circumstances, and you can't have someone outside telling you what's right and wrong, whereas conservatives much more tend to believe in the existence of a fixed, documentable morality that you can ex see outside of your, outs that's there external to you. These are the reverse. These are the ones where conservatives place a high value. Liberals tend to reject them. What's interesting here is the second one there you can see, war is sometimes the best way to solve a conflict. Conservatives agree with that statement. Liberals disagree. And then that other question that come up before the old fashioned ways and old fashioned values still show the best way to live, the bottom question there. That, that is where conservatives and liberals disagree the most. But uh, there are other, uh, respect for authority is something all children, all, something all children need to learn. Conservatives, yes, uh, and I would say as a grandfather, impossible. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, they, uh, conservatives say yes, liberals, no. Uh, people should not do things that are disgusting. Uh, why? <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. Uh, the, but more importantly is this one. If certain groups stayed in their place, we would have fewer problems. <laughs> uh, again, with my grandchildren, my wife, everybody, my <laughs> students. But at any rate, liberals don't agree with that. Uh, conservatives do. This is the trend on immigration, and this we should restrict and control people coming in to live in our country more than we do now. Republicans since 1992, when this was first conducted, have gotten more conservative on this issue. This issue. Democrats have become more liberal on this issue, although there is still not a great deal of support for immigration in that sense. Here we're getting into the international arena, the foreign policy questions. Most want the US less involved 
in U.S. political change. How involved should the United States be in Middle East uh, 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 leadership changes? Uh, more involved Democrats, 20, Republicans, 34. Less involved Republicans, 53, uh, uh, Democrats, 65. That's not so, so big, but we get to sharp ideology on dealing with Iran. Again, now we see the core democratic groups, i.e., in this case, young people, being far more, they 49% want to avoid a military conflict, in contra and 44 want the United States to take a firm stand which stands in contrast to all the older groups. The uh, liberal Democrats are just the bottom of the second line, second group are decisively in favor of avoiding middle, uh, military conflict. But more clearly, Obama voters are, want to avoid military conflict 48 to 43, whereas Romney voters want to take a firm stand 78 to 17. Now this is the Israel question, which is an interesting one. Uh, U.S. support of Israel is too supportive, not supportive enough, or about right? About right, well, that's actually significant differences. Uh, too supportive, uh, the total for all is 22%, but Republicans are down at 13 Democrats above that at 25. Not supportive enough though, i.e. wanting stronger pro-Israel stands. Republicans 46%, Democrats only nine. About right, Democrats say 55%. Now I think that if Obama was not, if a Republican was president, you'd see that that 55% decline and a lot of it go into too supportive, but we'll see. Republicans uh, have a mixed view about the pace of troop removal. Uh, they are uh, much, uh, much more reluctant to pull out. Uh, it goes, here's the Keystone Pipeline issue. Republicans are strongly in favor of the Keystone Pipeline. Democrats favor it, but only by a 49 to 33% margin. And liberal Democrats actually oppose it, 30 to 49. Um, the percent who favor to allowing more drilling in U.S. waters, Democrats 55, Republicans 67. More nuclear power, 38 Democrat, 52 Republican. More funding for alternative energy. This is what Democrats like, 87, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Republicans, 85. I was reading the Independent one. It was, the figures are much actually more striking. Uh, the allowing drilling in U.S. waters was 87 Republican, 55 Democrats, and promoting more nuclear power is 68 Republican, 38. Democrat. Here is for cutbacks, Republicans back cutbacks in foreign aid, health care, and assistance to the unemployed. Uh, here, economic assistance to the needy around the world. Uh, the percent saying to decrease the spending for that. Republicans, 40% uh, in 2009, growing to 70% in 2011. Beca become much more conservative on that. Democrats, 24, 28, independents, 44. But the Republicans have moved decisively anti-foreign aid to foreign poor countries. Government assistance for the unemployed is another one. The Republicans in just two years have gone from 28% uh, should be decreased to 50% calling for a decrease in the assistance for the unemployed. 
environmental protection. Republicans' sharp increase, 29 to 43% for reducing spending. Health care has gone way up among Republicans, 15% to 47%. Now we're getting towards the end here. I, I was struck looking at Canada how the Conservative Party really stands out as being much more conservative on almost every one of these questions. Uh, and it has majority power, but it's in terms of control of the parliament because of your system of plurality wins all. But I'm not sure that the Conservative Party reflects all the, the, the values of the country in the, the fullest sense. It's in this, uh, now, this was interesting. These are Canadian priorities. Uh, Canadians are more decent people than Americans. <laughs> I mean, uh, in the United States, well, I'm not sure that in terms of a priority, integrity and ethics would be high. Voters would say, they want their guys to be honest and ethical, but they wouldn't put it as a high priority. Here, it's your, your number two priority. A healthy population. I, I, I don't see Americans giving that 85%. I wish I had real numbers, but a clean environment. Uh, tolerance, I was really struck by that. 77% place a high, if, of you guys place a high value on tolerance. If that broke 25% in the States, I would be surprised. I mean, people are tolerant-ish, but they don't put a high priority on it. Uh, now, I was also struck here that Canadians, they like the United States, but that's not, they're not wild about the United States. <laughs> uh, 68% favorable, 21% unfavorable, 11% not sure. Yeah. Now, Americans love you guys. 96% favorable for Canada. What is that, 4% unfavorable? And you're number one on our list at the hit parade. So I was trying to figure out why is this? And my conclusion was, is that Americans are self-righteously moral. Uh, you guys are much more, you're less, well, I can't say you're more immoral, <laughs> but you don't place, your priorities are not designed to restrict personal behavior and you, the United States, as this headline says, are more morally conservative than Canadians and Britons. Uh, which I think is a good thing. But, and let me leave it at that. Now, if people want to ask questions, there's a lot of data presented here. And I would be glad, I can always go back to any slide anyone wants. But the places to ask questions are here and over here. And I would really like to hear anything that you folks have. Uh, here's Fred. So you know me, we had dinner together and uh, uh, very nice to hear your views on uh, your presentation before you gave it. But I'm curious to know, uh, in the light of all this data then, um, and I know that a lot of journalists like to report and not to be predictive because that's not really reporting, but um, looking at these numbers then and seeing Obama heading into his second term, still a split Congress, though, what do you expect to see then uh, from the Obama government in foreign policy, uh, you know, in light of the figures on the drones, but also Israel, but also the UN? Um, what do you think uh, his foreign policy, will, will it shift at all from what we've seen Will he be more decisive in certain areas? Uh, I 
I'm not a foreign policy specialist, so I'm winging it to some extent. But my feeling is that the caution in terms is going to be the central characteristic of the Obama administration in terms of any international intervention. That in Syria, for example, been much more careful and cautious. Uh, in uh, we would prefer to have other countries take the lead as the French did in many cases and as the Canadians have done to some extent. Uh, drones, I think, are sort of a, you may not like them, and they may not be the nicest thing in the world, but they sort of have become the perfect Obama approach in that they do not threaten, they don't, American lives are not at stake, and that's the first issue. He can keep up his war on terror and take out various terrorists in Africa and the Middle East, but he doesn't have to put American lives at stake. It doesn't take an American military intervention with troops to keep doing that. And I think it's sort of pulling, drones represent a sort of partial pullback from the much more intrusive and willing to be aggressive character uh, that we saw with George W. Bush. So I, I think the Obama coalition, which underpins all this, is very reluctant to support inter foreign intervention and does not want to see any increase and would like to see a decrease in defense spending. So all of those are for in a, a partial pullback from international involvement, especially international involvement that involves the use of military force. And I think that'll be a central characteristic on the foreign policy front. Do you have a question here? Yeah. Uh, two question, question number one. In your priority of Canada, you're missing the, our voting system against your voting system in USA. You don't mention that. What's the reason for that? I, I, I couldn't fully understand. The voting, that. our voting in Canada is completely different, or in other words, is more <coughs> generally acceptable phenomena of democracy better than USA. Could you explain that for me? Uh, you guys do have a different election system that uh, is quite striking. Uh, one, you have a multi-party system, which we do not have in the United States. There are basically only two parties, so that the party that wins any specific election, generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, wins an absolute majority. In this country, when you have three major parties and at least two or three minor parties, the, country, the, the party that wins a plurality, and that has been the conservative party, wins and they won all in the, in the 2011 election. That means you have a government with much greater power given to the executive, to, the, to uh, Steve Harper than is given to Obama on the basis of, what, 38% of the vote, as opposed to the United States, where Obama wins with 51% this time, 53% last time, but he has much less power to govern. It's a, th these are very different systems, and uh, they produce very different results. But the voting system in Canada, ensure all citizens register under election independent committee. Whether in the U.S., you have to register each vote. Is that discrimination? I, I, you mean in the, in Canada? Do you have to register? Uh, no, the, we have election Canada. This election Canada ensure that all citizens have under the same rule? Well, in theory. Well, in the US, you have to register yourself. Is that 
form of discrimination? The United States leaves up to the states the power to set voting rules. And conservative controlled states did try to restrict voting practices or pass laws taking back liberal voter registration practices. That's true. Uh, but in the United States, you do have the right to vote. How easy it's going to be or how hard it's going to be is going to be decided by individual states. And that can result in discrimination because people those effects are felt differently by different groups. That's true. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here. Go ahead. Thank you. First off, welcome. Um, I'm, I'm listening to your presentation and, and sort of the polarity that you're finding between the two different parties. Yeah. And that's very interesting and very intriguing in terms of how things are working down uh, south of the border. The news that we're hearing up here from the states, uh, one of the key words that we tend to hear is bipartisan. And we're hearing that more and more, not only in terms of the fiscal cliff, but in terms of the cooperation that's going to be needed to get a number of things passed and done um, in your country. And I may be wrong, but please correct me if I am. Um, I think, I think you are you wrong. Sorry? I think you, you mean you've heard that there is more bipartisanship? No, that there's a need for bipartisanship. Oh, the need. Well, that. Depends on whether you think it's possible to agree. What's happened in the United States with polarization and how it has become very intense is that the issues that divide the parties in many cases are very hard to compromise and achieve a bipartisan solution. If you believe that abortion is murder or if you believe that abortion is a crucial right for a woman to control her own reproductive processes, you can't really compromise in the middle and say, uh, after the first trimester, no abortion, but you, first trimester, it's okay. It's still first trimester is murder to one side and not in the second and third trimesters is a infringement on what is seen as a basic right. The, that kind of division has now spread to include taxes. Republicans view any tax increase as a violation of a, a fundamental moral principle that they've adopted. And th this is, this is uh, I'm trying to, uh, gay marriage, either, well, there is a compromise in that, which is civil unions, uh, but uh, at any rate, it, on the whole, though, people who, there are people who believe homosexual relations are a sin, and in any way, it's going to be a sin, whether it's uh, gay marriage or whether it's civil unions. Uh, so it's very, the bipartisanship has become very hard to achieve. Uh, I'm going on too long here, but I think the last election showed that the, on the culture war issues, which are the ones that have been very divisive, that the left has won those issues. In America, we had three states, I believe, enact referendum approving gay marriage. That was unprecedented. And the polls all show now majorities developing in support of gay marriage. We had two states approve the recreational use of marijuana, which may not sound like a culture issue, but it sort of fits that same category. So I think uh, that divisive set of issues, there's still going to be fights over them, but it's going to be like a rear guard action from the conservative side, and they're going to be in retreat over time. 
the, uh, that still, though, leaves taxes. In some sense, it leaves uh, foreign policy. Uh, the, uh, so, I mean, bipartisanship would be great, but you, if people disagree to a huge more, it just can't, it's like an impossible, it's like a nice fantasy to some extent. That doesn't really answer your question, but over, over there. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, wasn't that long ago, and I'm thinking of Karl Rove, was saying that he was putting together a conservative or Republican coalition that would last a generation. Now, the election results out of the most recent presidential election seem to be saying, oh, we've got a coalition forming around uh, the black, late, Latino, uh, et cetera, vote that's going to provide a systemic or underlying coalition of voting for a more liberal or progressive um, coalition for a generation. Do you think that's true? I, Karl Rove was, was in fact proved wrong. He th and I think Karl Rove made one huge error when he was, he was chief political advisor to President George W. Bush. And he had a chance, Bush had a chance in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks where basically Democrats, Republicans, foreign countries, everybody united in sympathy and support and his numbers went up. He had a favorability rating of 90%, which I think is unprecedented in America. He could have tried to establish the Republican Party as sort of a consensus party. And he chose instead, Karl Rove did really, not Bush. I don't think Bush knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> uh, but, but Karl Rove knew full well, and Rove chose to adopt a polarizing strategy looking forward to the 2004 election. And they actually used the Iraq war as an issue, as they used gay marriage as an issue. And they used it to separate Democrats and Republicans when they could have formed a unit. That's one thing. But the, the advantage for the Democrats and liberals right now is that every one of their constituencies, those core ones that I was describing, are growing. More, people are not getting married, so you have more unmarried voters, and they tend to be more to the left. Latinos are growing very fast. Asian Americans are growing. Uh, the professional, well-educated class is growing. All of these groups are just getting bigger and bigger so that you have demography is a powerful force behind the Democratic Party. But the Republican Party in the long run is not going to sit still. You can't, the function of a party, political party is to win. May not seem that way in the case of the liberals in this country. <laughs> uh, but that's actually the bread and butter of politics. You win and you help your people. And, then, uh, and the Republicans that are certain, they already are shifting somewhat on immigration, for example, because they know they have to start doing something to ameliorate their problems with Latino voters. And I think they're going to have to shift on culture war issues. And you see some movement there, not majority movement or anything yet, but they, so demography is a powerful force, but it is not destiny. But at the moment, demography is working in support of the liberal coalition. And it's gonna be, it has the potential to be a 30 year coalition. It's also very hard to maintain a coalition. You have different groups and, uh, especially a liberal coalition because it tends to include a lot of poor people. We are sort of facing, not sort of, we are facing increased austerity in the United States. That means cutting back. Who's going to get hurt in, as you cut back? And this, you get down to the city level, are you going to eliminate the school in the Hispanic neighborhood or in the black neighborhood? Are you going to, uh, all these issues make it hard to maintain a coalition. So 
And the answer to your question is yes, but with a big uh, caveat. Over here, I guess, here. Well, his father would not be re would, could not win a nomination in the party. Uh, and there's a strong argument that Ronald Reagan could not get nominated by the current Republican Party. The, it has moved clearly to the right on a lot of issues, and some of those charts showed that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that Fox News and others drive that, they certainly accommodate it and facilitate that kind of move by, uh, and Rush Limbaugh and, and, well, I think they do in a sense, drive, yeah, Rush Limbaugh and some of the t uh, talk radio people are clearly pushing that point of view and push it aggressively and hard. But they are also, they've got a market and that's what their market wants to hear. Uh, so it's, they're, they're playing to their market and their market is it's sort of a dynamic of, of multiple forces. Uh, but the, as I say, the ultimate problem comes when you start losing elections. And I mean, uh, the Republican Party in this last campaign, if you look at their, the guys who ran for president, Mitt Romney, Santorum and Gingrich, that's a bunch of nutcases. <laughs> I mean, Romney is not a nutcase, but he, he's, a, they're just not credible people. I mean, Gingrich and Santorum are off the wall. And for a while they led in the Republican polling. That, that's just, that's a party with problems at that point. <laughs> Uh, so your point's well taken. Uh, what the dynamics? I, I don't, not sure. Uh, one of the things that you didn't address, I wanted to ask you about. I do work in the U.S. and in in Canada with government entities and uh, with ethics and career and all kinds of different issues. But um, one of the things that strikes me very dramatically between Canada and the U.S. Um, is the differences in the education system. And by that, I mean the inability of most of the younger generation that I deal with in the U.S. to uh, think critically. So to when you're to, what? to think critically, to ask questions, to know what the question should be, and to ask the right questions. They want to know the answers, but they don't actually know what the questions are. So I really see a huge difference in the younger generation and their abilities to independently come to decisions. So I wanted to know if... I mean, Canadians do know they, how to answer, ask they, the they questions? They seem to be able to do a little bit better job, yes, especially the younger generation. And how that impacts both the Republican Party and you talked about the, uh, uh, you know, tends to be less educated people in the liberal coalition, which I agree with. How does that, how does the impact of lack of education and those sorts of critical thinking skills do you think impact elections in the U.S.? Well, I guess Americans are stupider. <laughs> no. Uh, no uh, there, I mean, there's a clear problem uh, with the American education, the U.S. American, uh, uh, education system. Uh, I don't know Canada's. Uh, 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 but you can't, don't forget that the liberal coalition also includes the best educated. If you, if you took advanced degrees, people with advanced degrees, they are Democrats. College graduates tend to tilt Republican, but actually people with more than a college degree tend to 
so they have very, very highly educated uh, support a base, and that's a growing base. I, that's a good question. I just don't have an answer to it. I, mean, I don't know. I about it, but I won't get into it right now. You should get the next lecture. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think one, uh, they're going to try to not necessarily to win more Hispanics, but to look more tolerant towards that. Being tolerant, being intolerant is a liability now in American politics, and looking like you're harshly judging others is not a good position to be. If you, this is a decade ago, and George W. Bush, in fact, was pro immigration. And he wanted to pass a law that provided a path to citizenship for those who are currently illegally in the United States. He sent that to Congress after he won election in 2004. And he said, I, I built a lot of capital up. This is part of what I want to spend it on. It got killed by Republicans. And it got killed by Republicans who referred to Hispanics in extremely derogatory terms. They talk, described them as being un-American, alien, not sharing American values, bringing uh, disease to, to America. I mean, really, and they said all this on the floor of the House and the Senate. The mainstream media didn't cover this that much, the CBS, ABC, NBC, whatever. But the Spanish language media which has become bigger and bigger in America. Univision and Telemundo are the two big uh, Spanish language TVs. There. They covered it extensively. And so the Hispanic community saw Republicans night in for a sustained period during this debate, describing them as really out beyond the pale as far as America. That was terrible for the party and it, it and that, along with their party's alignment with the Christian right, has proven now to become another liability for the Republic. It used to be a big benefit. The Christian right came in in 1980. It had boosted Republican numbers like crazy. It was a big benefit. Basically, it maxed out, and there's been a counter-reaction, especially in American suburbs, where you get fairly well-educated voters, uh, and they just don't like the Christian coalition kind of issues. The party has to get off of those. Where they could start rebuilding is trying to get back those suburban voters. Those, those voters once were moderate Republicans. They don't like taxes, but they hate Christian right kind of stuff. And the one, they just don't like to be told what's moral. Uh, and they don't like to be associated with a party that is seen as intolerant. So the Republican Party has actually quite a bit of room there. The only problem with that is that it keeps the Republican Party basically lily white. We're talking about adding more whites to an already overwhelmingly white party. So the... Uh, the achievement of some diversity is where they are going to have real struggles. That, incidentally, was one thing I, I didn't have it in the poll data here. But you Canadians actually like diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, I mean, it was viewed as, as, in some polls, as a high priority for the government to encourage, or the sort of policy to encourage a diverse nation. Uh, I don't think you'd get that in the United States. Uh, but I, I just throw that as an aside. But the Republic, there is room to grow, but it's got, there are a lot of delicate problems to be worked out. 
Anyone more over there? Or should we just go? go ahead. Uh, obviously, the Republican Party probably has more data than you do. So obviously, they're losing their demographic war. Do you think it, uh, they're going to resort to gaming the system in the future? Like, there's talk recently of them um, abolishing the electoral co college system and dividing uh, uh, state votes into uh, proportionate, which would give them a victory in the last election. And then the second thing was uh, Citizens United. Do you think uh, it had a huge effect on this election at all? Two good questions. The first, if you didn't hear that, uh, was the Republic. Well, the Republicans, now that they're behind the eight ball, uh, when they in 2010, I mean 2011 and 12, leading up to this current election, tried to pass legislation in many states restricting access to the ballot booth. Not preventing it, but making it hard to get it, to get to register to vote, you'd have to show a photo ID. A lot of, you'd be surprised, but a lot of people don't have photo IDs. Then they'd even add provisos saying, it was interesting, you're, if you had a what's called in America a concealed carry license, i.e. you could carry a revolver concealed on your, which would, has a photo, you could use that for your ID, but if you were a student ID, would not be, would not qualify. <laughs> uh, they tried a lot of things. That actually worked probably against them. That, like Philadelphia, Pennsylvania passed a photo ID law and it was seen in the black community as hurting black turnout. Many more blacks statistically have, do not have photo IDs. Uh, turnout, though, was way up in black precincts, in, in, in Philadelphia particularly. And so now the next step is this idea. United States now, in almost all states, the winner gets, every state is allotted electoral college votes. There are 538 such votes allocated to the states by primarily a formula of population. Some states now are talking about instead of having a winner take all, like all 23 of Pennsylvania's uh, electoral college votes go to whoever gets 50 plus 1 percent of the vote, it would go be divided by congressional district, every congressional district, the majority in that district would cast one vote. So you'd have, you could have, instead of 23 votes going to Obama, which happened last time, you in fact would have had a majority of congressional districts in Pennsylvania casting votes for Romney. And he would have won Pen a majority of Pennsylvania's that would be their new, and if you do electoral, that kind of voting nationwide, it gives the Republican Party a huge advantage and the ability to win when they clearly have lost the majority vote. Uh, we'll see how that goes. It's a, uh, they're gonna be tested in the courts because it really does distort outcomes in an interesting way. What was your other question? It was, uh, uh, Citizens United. Oh, Citizens United. I think, uh, actually, Citizens United shows something that's very interesting going on in the United States. The, uh, if you've read about inequality at all, the top 1% and the top 0.1% in the United States has gained the overwhelming lion's share of the income increase, and regular people below that have gotten no, very little of the, uh, there's been a huge increase at, at the top. Money is equivalent to political power. The Supreme Court in 2010 basically opened the floodgates for political contributions from rich people and corporations into the political system. What you have then is, and this is also, there's more to this, but the very elite have gained increasing power over the levers of politics, money, and uh, uh, lobbying, and the ability to offer congressmen as they retire great jobs, for example, the whole network of, so that 
what's called by one writer the plutocracy has gained great leverage, but at the same time, you have the Obama coalition moving up, which is counter to the plutocracy. And in the long run in the United States, we're gonna see, I think, a real tension between this empowered plutocracy and the growing influence of the Obama coalition. It's gonna be uh, a real war. And, but the Citizens United helped empower those on the top, but it's not sure that, that they're not clear that they can act in full agreement with each other. And th their effect in the election was mixed at best. One more, I guess. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for coming. I have a couple of questions, being no one else seems to be stepping up. I'm not feeling too guilty. Um, you're saying it's more of a right-left. There's also a theory coming into the fore that it might be a north-south, like it's a re refighting of the Civil War as the anti as the uh, Dixiecrats have basically moved from being the Democrats to the Republicans, and the Nixon Southern strategy has come back to haunt them in that they now you know, the heirs of uh, Jim Crow are now running and owning the political Republican Party. It, it's not just the Republicans have changed, it's that there's a new, uh, the, the, the population who are Republicans used to be the radical right Southern Democrats, the Dixiecrats, and now they're Republicans and they've taken it over, especially in the Tea Party version of them. And uh, so that's one question. Um, why are the Republicans so much more passionate about winning? Because once they win, they, they use it automatically, they stuff the, ba they stuff the judges, uh, which nominate judges which are very radical right, um, they, they gerrymander, they use uh, whatever chance they have to gerrymander, vote suppression, they do stuff that, uh, you know, the liberals or the Democrat, uh, you know, the liberals, Democrats, et cetera, et cetera, just don't seem to be willing to do like uh, Obama's often criticized that he's been so tardy in uh, doing judicial appointments and he's still allowing or the right wing nuts to uh, s set policy by uh, through the bench and let me take uh, let me take the second question first that's all one, one, one of the the question is why does the Republican Party play hardball when they win and, and really put the squeeze on Democrats and liberals and put their own people and policies in position, whereas the Democrats are kind of wusses. Uh, the fact is Democrats are kind of wusses. <laughs> they, they believe in compromise. It's true of liberals in general. They could, you can hold two opposing points of view. You know, this side's got a point, this side's got a point. Conservatives are, and this is a, not a criticism. They tend to, they believe in hierarchy. They believe in, uh, they see the world much more as a us versus them context, whereas liberals do not. It's like that. I, liberals believe in peace in the world. Uh, conservatives believe sometimes you gotta fight and kill the other guys. That, those are different attitudes to bring into the political arena, and they play out in politics. Uh, uh, and I gotta say, I think that your guy here, Steve Harper, is, is acting to some extent like a uh, conservative in this respect. Uh, he's playing hardball. Uh, but it, playing hardball, I think Obama in his first administration was a wuss. And he thought he could come in and achieve conciliation and agreement and all was going to be love and kumbaya, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he did, uh, the Republicans just punched him in the stomach, punched him in the stomach, punched him and sort of hit him over the head. And it took about 50 hits over the head with a two by four before he started the fight. Uh, and he gave away a ton, especially in the 2011 uh, debt ceiling fight. Uh, so, um, what can I say? 
that's part of the character of left and right, uh, for whatever it's worth. The uh, what was the first question again? It was the oh, on center right and left is it becoming a issue oh north south. south. Yes. Um, I think what, let me put this into some context. I think that the Republicans rose, especially at the time the left was leading insurgencies. It was leading the civil rights movement after Democrats and liberals led it. It was at the forefront of the women's rights revolution. It was at the forefront of the civil rights revolution. I mean, the uh, sexual revolution, and it was at the forefront of the gay rights revolution. When those are initial insurgencies, they're challenging the status quo, and most people are going to decide that it's going to be, the, the insurgencies are threatening and worrying especially. They've, all those insurgencies have become increasingly incorporated into the culture, but for a long time, they worked to the advantage of the Republican Party to be on the opposition, basically, to those insurgencies. They, over time, I think those, as I said, the, I think the culture war has now shifted and is, the left commands the heights and the right is down and they, uh, is more easily fired upon. That shift, basically has made acceptable being for gay marriage. It's made acceptable all kinds of things that used not to be acceptable. And the Republican Party's position and its identification in particular with the South and with the Christian right all are now turning into, I think, liabilities that are gonna to have to be addressed. So that's, that's part of a sort of a larger cultural intellectual, ideological shift taking place in the country. I think I'm being, that this is time. You guys are better than Americans. <laughs> uh, uh, good to talk to you. Very good to talk to you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I, a few comments before we adjourn. First of all, I want to thank you uh, for the exceptional presentation and discussion this evening and your generosity with the questions. I think we all now have a better understanding of how uh, U.S. electoral attitudes are driving uh, the U.S. agenda. And, uh, and I think it's fair to say that people are in Canada would have generally been watching this with some distress. Uh, to see the polarization that you've so clearly outlined because we certainly have a stake in it. Uh, our economies are very intertwined um, and it's hard to imagine a, a prosperous Canada without a prosperous U.S. So when this doesn't bode well for the sort of congressional deadlock and the issues that affect def and death and, uh, debt and deficit, um, it makes us worry about the economic impacts for us. Um, but we don't blame the messenger. You brought us the data and the, and the explanations. Uh, but we have our own uh, survey data at CG. We find that when eminent American journalists uh, fight their way through a winter storm to come here and freely share their views, um, that they have a virtual 100% approval rating in this auditorium. So <laughs> thank you again. Uh, a few quick notes for the audience. Um, uh, thank you for coming in this inclement weather to, to hear this lecture tonight. I also want to thank the online audience. Um, the video from this webcast will be edited and posted to CG's website in the coming days, uh, so you can watch it there. And please also visit our blogs uh, page on our website, where in a few uh, days you will see a, a posting about tonight's event. Our next event in the CG Auditorium, um, there are a couple coming up in March. Uh, visiting Fulbright Scholar at CG and the Bosley School of International Affairs, Robert Rotberg, who is here tonight, by the way, will discuss catching up with Asia, Africa's critical current challenges. And that lecture on the 7th begins at 7 p.m. And on March 25th, 
As uh, Thomas pointed out tonight, we will have award-winning journalist and vice chair of the UN's Global Commission on HIV and Law, Shireen al feki looking at shifting sexual attitudes and behavior in the Arab world. The lecture entitled Sex in the Citadel also starts at 7 o'clock. Uh, so be sure to register for our events newsletter if you haven't already for information on these upcoming lectures. And finally, thank you again to our event sponsors, 570 News and Wordsworth Books. Uh, thank you for coming tonight and please be extra careful going home tonight.